and greetings. I'm always amazed how fast a year goes by that we're here recording these uh, sermons of the first and last day of Unleavened Bread. It seems like it's just yesterday we did this, and we're doing it again. The older you get, it seems like the faster the time goes by. But here it is, the first day of Unleavened Bread. You've observed the Passover. I always find it kind of amusing when you hear modern preachers say that Christ, when Christ died, he said, he said it was finished. That was all there was, that was all there was to it. But it never hit, uh, enters their mind to think about when you go back to the original Passover. Why did he keep on going with the days of unleavened bread and all the other holy days for if if the Passover was was it? And they just don't really understand. So when you watch some of these religious programs, uh, you hear the preacher say. You need to repent of sin, but they never tell you what sin is. There are these days of unleavened bread, as you and I are members of God's true church, in order to rid ourselves of sin, we have to know what it is. And we must now realize just how broad and how gigantic and how ghastly sin is. You and I, as the body of Christ, we know the main definition Biblical definition of sin is in 1 John 3, 4. It says, Whosoever commits sin transgresses also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. But that's not what all the Bible says about sin. There's much more to it than that. The Bible portrays and defines law-breaking in several dozen ways. The subject sin becomes so gigantically broad, you may be surprised at what sin really is, more than just what we read a while ago. How many do you know, how many of us know in the body of Christ that sin falls into three categories? Maybe you never heard of that before. Well, let's go back to 1 John, the second chapter, in verse 15 and 16. This is a familiar verse for all of us, but let's read it and look at the three different categories which define sin. 1 John, the second chapter, verse 15, says, Love not the world, neither things that are in the world. If man loves the world, that is Greek word for cosmos, or meaning society, or way of life. The love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, all it is the cosmos. The lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. So you need to ask yourself this question. Do you love your lifestyle? Your way of doing things. If so, God says, you love this world. And this world is going to pass away. If you look at verse 17 there, it says this world will eventually pass away into lust thereof, and, and he that does the will of God abides forever. So the Apostle John here divides sin into three things. It's in the world, that everything in the world into three classes of category. Verse 16, in other words, sin is a trinity. Sin is a trinity. The first one, one there, number one, is the lust of the flesh. This particular lust is that of pulling, yearning, and down-dragging very powerful desires, temptations to satisfy and to please the body. That's the lust of the flesh. And lust is an unlawful desire to satisfy yourself, your normal self. And God wants us to be healthy, you know. He wants us to be healthy and prosper and all this stuff. Number two is the lust of the eyes. This is another illegal desire, but the same. But the, this time it is through the eyes instead of the flesh. Sometimes our eyes focus on things that do not belong to us, don't they? So we think, ah, that would really be nice. I wish I'd like to lay my hands on that. I mean, it's said that, looking at a nice car, a nice home, and you look at that, boy, I'd like to have one of those things. Those cars, this nice home, and things like that. Our eyes incite us to lust and to covetousness, to greed and to envy. That is the lust of the eyes. The third one is the pride of life. 
Here John is speaking of physical life. John's original word for pride means the puffing or swelling or be heady or billowing, superior or proud, exalted feeling which all of us human beings have experienced. The pride of life is a warm, good, elevated, self-satisfying feeling that we get when when, we, when someone pats us on the back. When someone tells us, hey, you're pretty good. Has anybody ever said that to you? I've heard it many times, and I'm sure you have too. And you like that feeling, don't you? But how many of us in, in God's church has experienced the pride of life somewhere in our lives? We thought deep down inside, yeah, we're right. But actually, we were wrong. Our righteousness, for whatever its form, whatever its brand, was just so much ego and so much pride. All sin fits into generally into one or more of these three categories of 1 John, 2nd chapter, verse 15. Those three, those trinity of sin. But notice how closely sin fits into John's three-way dis- description. Let's go all the way back to Genesis. Back to the very beginning here. This is man's first sin. It fits in these three categories. In Genesis 3 and verse 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was, one, a good for food, and it was, two, pleasant to the eyes, and three, a desire to make one wise, she took of the fruit, therefore, and did eat. Now, do we all catch that? Eve was not satisfied with what? She was not satisfied with God's food. And I was thinking about this. Maybe this is the problem with half the church. Well, half of the church is going to be foolish because they're no longer satisfied with God's food. Now they want this physical food that Eve wanted. She didn't want God's food anymore. She saw the fruit was good for food. That is her flesh her taste buds, her appetite, lusted for a particular food. In other words, Eve had an illegal desire to satisfy the body. What is that but the lust of the flesh? Secondly, it was pleasant to the eyes. Eve's mind through her eyes lusted after something pleasant to her own sight. The same as John's lust of the eyes. Third, Eve's mind was desired to be make one's wise. She took, for she she looked for something to exalt, to puff her up, to expand and swell the self, and that was the pride of life. Both Adam and Eve yielded to the triple temptation, did they not? They disobeyed God, and they sinned. They broke God's law. Man's first sin fits all three of John's categories for law breaking. So how many of us today are just like that? In God's church, we know the world's like that. The fruit God gave them was not good enough. Is it good enough for you? Are you getting tired just like the house of Israel did of eating manna? That was God's food. They got sick and tired of it. They wanted something different. They no longer wanted the food from heaven. That seems like half the church is that way. Now, if we understand Matthew 25 right, that... The five foolish versions no longer desire God's food. And they have, if you'll notice that the Holy Spirit they once had is almost gone. They're almost 100% carnal. And eventually, they don't end up in the lake of fire. It seems like it's, it's always the forbidden fruit that appeals to us, is it not? Always. Our, my, our eyes, our mind... And our bodies deceive us into thinking the grass is always greener somewhere else. But it really isn't. Reading about Adam and Eve and how sin affected them, let's uh, go to the Bible. and these, That's why these days of unleavened bread are all about. How sin affects us today. How we are to overcome sin. Sin destroys you. God hates sin. He even turned his back on his own son when sin, he became sin for us. He hates it. He, he gave us these days 
in the Bible there, the Bible you have right in front of you, as an instruction manual for us to understand the complications of sin. You, I've said this many times, you and I are a copy of the original. And the original is composed of spirit, and God wants this copy to become like the original, sinless. So he gave us the days of only bread, and he told us exactly what sin was. It is complicated. The mind, we were created with a sinful mind to go the opposite direction, but he has called you and I out of this world to root that out of our mind, to root sin out of our mind. In order to root sin out of our lives, we must know more about it, don't we? But the other is just 1 John 3, 4. That is the transgression of the law. You may not be aware of it, but the Bible uses various words for sin, showing various shades of its meaning. God, through his word, shows us that sin is complex, not as simple as we might think. The first and most common word is kata, K-H-A-T-A. That means to miss the mark. That's the Greek word. That's the Hebrew word. That's the point for us. Missing the mark is not necessary from the habit of sinning. What? Missing the mark may not be from the habit of sinning. We miss the mark. Why? Because we don't want to hit it badly enough. Does that sound about right? We don't want to hit the mark badly enough. Because we don't practice hitting the mark, do we? And because we don't have enough of God's spirit to hit the mark, to stay there. As Christians, we must realize we're built short of the mark. That's the way we're made. We are mark missers. Misfits by nature, the way God created us. So most of us, and I know I'm guilty of all of this, at some point have yielded to temptations. If we yield to temptations, we what? We miss the mark. We kata. We kata. Notice what David said when he committed adultery with Bathsheba. It's in Psalms 51, verse 4. Psalms 51, verse 4. He says, against thee, that is God, and the only have I sinned, a kata, a missed the mark, and done this evil in your sight. David allowed, allowed himself to drift away. He did that. He drifted away from God. Here's a man after God's own heart, drifting away from God, and temptations overcame him. How many times do we drift away? How many times do we take that broad way before we get back on that little narrow path? How many times do we give in to temptation? Do we give in to kata and miss the mark? Miss that mark that God set before us to quit sinning. If you want to be in my government, you want to be a part of my family. My family is perfect. And you have to learn to hit the mark more often. God told Cain that sin, that is kata, would try to pull him down. And it did. He didn't pay any attention to what God told him. And he missed the mark. And he killed his brother. So God's word to Cain applies to the whole human race. Genesis 4 and verse 7, he says, Genesis 4 and verse 7, he says, If thou doest well, thou shalt not, he's talking to Cain, and shall not be accepted. And if thou doest not, does not well, do well. If you disobey, and he did that, sin lies at the door. So we know the story about that. He killed his brother, he sinned, he missed the mark. He did not believe what God said, or he didn't care one way or the other. I don't really know what went through his mind. But the Revised Standard Version makes this uh, a little bit more clear. He says, sin desires, he says, sin desires, desire will pull you down, but you must master it. That's what Christ is trying to tell us, and that's what the Bible is all through the Bible trying to tell us. You've got to master this. Because I, you can't be a part of my government with an imperfect mind. He won't have that. So that's why God gave us, the church, these holy days, these days of unleavened bread. That's what they're all about. To help us to quit missing the mark. Quit doing this thing. And quit violating God's law. Quit re you got to learn to resist temptations. We must not yield. We must strive always to hit the mark. And it's hard at times. It's really hard to do that on a constant daily basis. But that's what God requires of us to hit that mark on a daily basis, to stay inside the bounds of his laws. 
So the one day that seed will remain in us and we cannot sin once we're born again into God's kingdom. Jeremiah describes a time when the entire land of Israel was filled with sin. This is what he says in Jeremiah 51st verse and verse 5. He says, For Israel hath, it be Jeremiah 51st chapter and verse 5. For Israel hath not been forsaken, nor Judah his God, of Lord of hosts, and the Lord of hosts, though their land was filled with sin against the Holy One of Israel. That is, they missed the mark. They missed the mark. Another word for sin is asham. I think it's what he printed, A S H A M. It means to incur guilt, sometimes through ignorance or neglect. So are you guilty of neglect? Are you guilty of these things? Do you really produce on the job you have? Does it make any difference? What your, it doesn't make any difference what your job is. We must put out, you can't put out sloppy, half-hard, hardly done work. You can't do that. If you do that, that is a sin in God's sight. You give it everything you got. As members of God's church, we are to strive to, the, to do the job better than anybody else. Because what he's offering us, he's offering us eternal life in his kingdom, a very high position in his cabinet members in the government of God. So we have to learn to do things wholeheartedly, the right way, the correct way, not sloppy, sloppy and half-heartedly going through a job. It doesn't make any difference what it is, what job it is. It is a sin. And you've got to remember this. True Christians of this world are not often great, are the great of the world. You may ask yourself and say to yourself, maybe I've said this to myself, I don't have much ability as the next man, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's our zeal that counts. It's our attitude that counts. It's the zest for the work that is put in front of us, how we, our attitude towards all this. Remember, you're in, you're in co competition against you not the other fellow. I remember when I was in a speaking contest in the school I was at, the school I was going to, and the other guy said, you're so much better. And I said, you're not in competition with me. You can't do anything about what I say or do. You have to do your the best you can do. Don't worry about what I say. Do the very best you can do because you're not in competition with me. So another very common Old Testament word for sin is aven, A-V-E-N. This word is often connected with idolatry. Remember, idolatry is something that you put higher than God or anything you love more than God. So how much do you love God? How much do you obey God? How much effort do you put into being a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ? How much do you, effort do you put in an ambassador of the kingdom of God? of doing things God's way. How much do you really, truly love your eternal God? The words sometimes express the nothingness of sin. It may include deception, self-deception, or illegal injust or legal injustice. Amen. 1 Samuel, the 15th chapter, verse 22, he writes this, verse 23, For rebellion is a sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is iniquity as idolatry. Sin or event occurs in this phase, in this phrase, and stubbornness is as iniquity or alvin as idolatry. The Bible tells us that stubbornness is a form of idolatry. If you have a flint mind, you have a flint heart, it's like stone, you don't have a soft heart, nobody can tell you to do anything, you know it all. Have you ever met anybody like that? I have. Are you that way? Nobody can tell you anything. You know it all. So since you know it all, then God's food that we give you is not good enough for you. You have to try to find some other food in some other place. Notice how the concept of idolatry connected, connected with of, of the Aven type. Sin helps to explain. In Isaiah, the first chapter, verse 13, he says, the new moons, Isaiah, the first chapter, verse 13, says, the new moons and the Sabbath, the, the calling of the symbols, I cannot, oh, I cannot stand, away with them. It is iniquity, avin. 
even the solemn meeting. So the next verse tells us what he's talking about. He says, we're talking about your unions, not God's, because you're polluting them, and your appointed feasts, not God's. You have sin. You went away from doing the way God says you to do things on these holy days. Are any of us still stubborn? Are you stubborn? Are you bullheaded? Or is your particular brand of vanity personal idolatry? Vanity is not always is not all that is wrong with our society. Satan is twisting everything to be crazy. Just look at look at us. You ever see anything as weird and uh, as the human race is now? The way people dress, their hair sticking straight up, all different colors. People's pants hanging down below their waistline, dress sloppy, tattoos all over their body, can't think straight, don't know if they're a girl or a boy. It's just a crazy, crazy world. And that's what Satan has done. He's twisted everything God said is right, and he's made things weird, outlandish, offbeat, and perverse. Look how the homosexuals are coming out of the closet, which they should have stayed there. And they're just about 1% or 2% of the population of the United States, and yet they get their way. Doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. And it is perverse. So Satan is twisted to make things, it looks, well, they were born that way. They can't help themselves. Everything we do is a choice. We make a choice. So this describes our society. I mean, means crookedness or in international sin all over the world. People are violating God's law. And he's putting up, he's, uh, put up with it for about 6,000 years. And there is coming a time when he says enough is enough. And he will intervene. What about the so-called modern music? The rap, the noise. I go to ball games. And that's all they play. This old rap music. While the ball players out there warm up, and it just drives me nuts. It's not even music. It's not. It's it's worse than noise. It makes no sense whatsoever. So it seems to be the goal of modern, many modern composer, to make as many notes of clash and discord as possible. But God knew this. He knew what this generation would do. He knew it would bend, twist God's law, the natural beauty, into wrong use. He knew it this long before we did. That's why he's God. That's why he inspired the words of him to describe our sins today. Jeremiah, the 16th chapter, verse, six, uh, verse 10. Jeremiah 16, verse 10. He says, Wherefore hath the Lord pronounced all this great evil against us, or what is our iniquity, or avin? Or what is our sin, akata, that we have committed against the Lord our God? Then shall thou say unto them, because your fathers have forsaken me, because, says the Eternal, and have walked after other gods, and have served them, and have forsaken me, and have not kept my law, therefore I will cast you out of this land, into a land that you know not. That happened to the House of Israel. And this is going to happen to the United States of America because we're just like this, people. We're a full of idolatry. And every sin we could think of, pornography, you name it, on television, I'm, I'm surprised at the words I hear anymore on daytime television. It's, it's, it's incredible. The violence, the destruction of the human mind through these things is an affront to God. But he will take care of this. He will take care of this in due time. God knew that we would come up to be this crazy. We would be this offbeat. Modern art and weird music and lustful dances. That's what the one movie, I think it was called Dirty Dancing. You couldn't get any more lustful than that. It's in Jeremiah 16, verse 17. It says, Surely our iniquities are of uh, in is not hidden from God's eyes. He knows what's going on. We can't hide anything from him. It's impossible to hide things from him. I 
Another word for sin is A-M-A-L. Amal, I guess they pronounce it. A-M-A-L. It means labor or toil, usually including the idea of wearisome or painful effort. Through this word, though this word can be translated sin, it brings out a special aspect of sin. Sin is not a delicious or sweet. The result of sin is always painful, always agonizing. Just to make a... Uh, I got ahead of myself. Sin is, is not delicious or sweet. It's the result of sin is always painful, agonizing, unhappy, and toil. That's the result of sin. What about someone who likes to gamble? It's even shown on television now. I can't believe on Sports Network you can watch people gamble. How's that a sport? But they do anything they can to do to make a fast buck. They'll stay up all night, drive all the way across the country, or the state, and skip meals, worry, schemes and plans and plots, fights off headaches, backaches, hangovers, just to get something for nothing. That is A-M-A-L, a sin. Solomon writes this in Sol uh, Proverbs 13, chapter verse 15, says, The way of the transgressor, transgressors is hard. That's what, that's what we're talking about here, this one word here, A-M-A-L. It's hard. And then the result of that is always suffering and misery. A lot of painful labor and toil or sin goes into people who like to bodybuild. These people live in a world of mirrors. They wear short tie pants and they like to look at themselves. Holes and all this stuff. Now I used to lift weights when I was in Vietnam. Uh, had to do something the past time. Wasn't, somebody put a bar and, and put cement blocks on the end of them and that's what I did. I lifted those things while I was in Vietnam. And it's hard work. It's, you toil at it. Mirrors are essential part of, I didn't have those over there. But mirrors are essential part of bodybuilding apparatus. They usually work, in t these people usually do their work in tight bathing trunks so they can see themselves. Boy, look at me. Look how I'm doing. They have built up the vanity and the pride of physical life. As members of God's church, how much effort are we putting forth just to get around the law? Let that sink in. How much effort, if you're doing this, are you putting in just to get around the law to get your way? It takes pain and toil to get around God's law and man's law also. Another word for sin is M-A-A-L. If you are disloyal, if you're a faithless, faithless or hypocritical, you are sinning. Disloyal. Do you know that? If you're disloyal, you're sinning. Faithless, you're sinning. It also means to act treacherous, treacherously, unfaithfully, and fraudulently. This word is sometimes used with adultery. Adultery is a form of disloyalty, don't you think? And dishonesty. Adultery fills this nation. It's an amazing. I think we'd be shocked to find out how many people in this, just in the United States alone, commits adultery. Ezra, Ezra the 10th, Chapter and verse 10 says, Ezra was a priest, stood up. Ezra 10, verse 10. Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, You have transgressed, A-M-A-A-L, and have taken strange wives to increase the trespass of Israel. So you may not be an adulterer or an adulteress, but how good is your word? How good is your word? As Christian, it should be as good as gold. Is it? Are you willing to suffer in order to keep your word? Now that's something to think about, right? Are you willing to suffer in order to keep your word? David writes in Psalms 93 and verse 5, God's words never fails. Thy testimonies are sure. Ask yourself, how loyal are you to God's work and to his word? How loyal and faithful are you to that? Are you loyal only while it is convenient for you? Are you willing, as David was willing, to hurt yourself, to suffer loss, to sacrifice whatever 
whatever, rather than see the work of God take a loss? What are you willing to do in order for this work not to take a loss? How faithful are you to God's work? If you're not, it is a sin. You didn't know anything about this work until God put you here and called you and opened your mind. That's what I, when I've talked to God, that's what I tell him. I said, I wasn't looking for you. I was, the, you weren't lost. I was the one that lost. You were the one that found me. You're the one that called me. You're the one that opened my mind to your truth to understand why I'm here, who you, what you are, what your laws and what sin is all about. And I'm not going to be faithful to you and your word. I don't take it that serious. Well, I've been in the church going over since 1973, 1976 rather, and I never lost the zeal for this work. I never thought I'd be where I'm at in this position now, but it's, it's the way it is. But I don't want this, this work to take a loss. I want this work to go out stronger than ever before. When God tells us to lift our voice like a trumpet, a trumpet is not like any other instrument. The trumpet sound will pierce the ear. It'll make people mad. God's word does make people. So what? If they get offended, so what? It is our part as a part of the body of Christ to get this work out there, to get it done. If you don't want to do that, then God says, these people's blood's going to be on your hand. I don't want that on my hand. I don't want the church of God to take a loss. I'll do what I have to do in order for us to get on and be more powerful than ever before. If we are loyal to God, and we had better be, God in due time will reward us. If you're not loyal, then you're a sinner. How about that? If you're not loyal to the work of God, you are a sinner. You are guilty of M-A-A-L. I'm not sure. I wish I knew how to pronounce it. I'm not sure. God is fed up with sin. So what is Jesus Christ doing? What are they doing right now? Jesus Christ is busily preparing for a new world which will gradually stamp out sin. It's going to take a little while using that rod of iron, but eventually we will root it out. It will be rooted out. So right now, as the members of the Church of God, during these days of unleavened bread, which is more than just seven days, it's an entire lifetime for us, he's purging out sin out of the church. He's correcting us. He's giving us more information that the prophets never had, never have more understanding of what this work is all about, what this life is all about. So he's preparing us. And Christ said in the book of Revelation, the bride, that's you and it's me, has made herself ready. How did you do that? How did you make yourself ready? Well, the empire of the Holy Spirit helps you to root out sin as much as we possibly can. What we cannot do, God says he will finish it for us. So he's purging us. He's correcting us. He's judging us. How we're doing, how we're overcoming during these days of unleavened bread. So how are you doing? How much, how much of your mind is spiritual? How much is carnal? Only you can answer that. God knows. He, only you can answer that question. Now, I realize this. I realize sin is hard because it is customary. It is usual. It is pleasant. It's easy. And it's habitual. Sin is a bitch. This is like a drug. That's really what it is. Sin is a drug. So you've got to make yourself do the opposite, which is not what your mind wants to do. Your carnal mind, that is. It wants to continue in the ways of this world. So those three categories of the trinity of sin. That's what it wants to do. But you have to make yourself do it. But you can't do it by yourself, and God's willing to help you. These three definitions for sin help us to locate, spot, and pinpoint the sin in our daily lives. If you really want to look, if you really want to be an overcomer, that's what Christ said. That's what he says to those who overcome, those who conquer yourself, those who root out sin as much as you possibly can, I will give you power over the nations. So who is your enemy? Sin is. Sin is our enemy. And it has a target. You and me. His desire is for us 
but we have no choice but to master it. If we do not master this, this is how serious this day is. If we do not master this sin, then we will not inherit eternal life. It's just that simple. If we don't master sin now, while we have the chance, we may end up like a retrobate. That is a person who cannot cease from sin. And that's what Peter, Second Peter, the second chapter, in verse 13, 15, talk about. You don't want to do that. Sin is not a person. Sin is not a personality. Sin is a force. It is a power. Sin pulls us down, makes us want to go the wrong way. But it looks good, doesn't it? That broad way really looks good to the lust of the eyes. It looks so good. It's hard not to go that way. But it robs us of the blessing and the good things the Creator has intended for us. He wants to bless us. So, during these days of unleavened bread, if you want to win the battle against sin, we must clearly see what sin is. We must know our enemy in order to defeat it. Do you know your enemy? Very soon, hopefully not too much longer down the road here, God is going to intervene. He's going to intervene. Why? Because of sin. He is going to shake this earth. That's what you can read about that. And I think it's Isaiah, the 24th chapter. He's going to shake this earth to wake us up because we simply don't get it. We don't seem to get it. In the New Testament, there are some words, different words for saying in the Greek and see what they mean. It's kind of mean about the same thing as the Old Testament words, but the first one is H-A-M-A-R-T-I-A. H-A-M-A-R-T-I-A. It kind of means the same word as kata. In other words, to miss the mark. Pasha, P-A-S-H-A, P-A-S-H-A means to revolt, to rebel, to change allegiance, to fall away, to apostatize, apostatize. And that's is that what Paul says in the book of Thessalonians and also about over in the book of Hebrews, that people will fall away. They will change their allegiance from eating the food of God to eating somebody else's food and going the wrong way giving in, revolting against God, rebelling against God's law. I'm talking about church members. And that's exactly what is going to take place. Look at how many have already done that so far. And the tribulation is not even here yet. The persecution of the true church of God has not really happened in this end time church yet. So what are you going to do if you're not strong enough to stand up against this? Are you going to change your allegiance, cause a little pain and suffering, maybe in death? God knows this. Look what we did to him, his son. Look what they did to the apostles later. Look what they have done to the Christians down through the ages. Look what they've done to the prophets of old. Did they not kill them and persecute them and torture them in every facet? Look at what the great cloud of witnesses in the book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter of Hebrews, look what they went through. And they're human just like you and me. Just because it happened back then uh, doesn't mean it can't happen again. And it's going to happen again. God must know where you stand. Are you loyal and faithful to him? Or will you rebel and, and change alliance, allegiance to somebody else? Will you just give up and fall away? Another one means S-H-A-G-A-H. I wish I could pronounce these Greek words. But it means to stray. It means to swerve, to meander, either mentally or, mentally or morally. Here's a question. I bet you never heard of this before. For what reason do you want to get rid of sin? You say, what? What did he say? For what reason do you want to get rid of sin? Is it just for yourself and not for God? Or probably you're not overcoming. If you think that way. Sin is hard to root out because it is customary as I said, and it's pleasant, it's easy, and it's habitual. That's why we must 
have more than just one day of unleavened bread. There's seven days. Seven days to get this job done, to clean our minds up, to unplute our minds in the church of God, and to get on with the job at hand and to grow and to overcome that one day that upon the return of Jesus Christ, he can see, look down at you and see there's a spiritual, mature person that I want into my kingdom. There is someone there that I want to uh, be a part of my government, to rule with me, along with the, the prophets and the apostles and everybody else who's going to be there, the great cloud of us. I want you there because you have been an overcomer. You have achieved. You've been an achiever. You've never quit. You've never given up. You've never dis been disloyal. You have understand what sin is all about and how to get it out of your life with the help of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit to root it out, branch and all, so we can become spiritually perfect in the very near future and once we are born again to the very family of God. This is what First Peter, this is what Peter said in First Peter, the fourth chapter, in verse 1 and 2. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. Is that what he told in the book of Philippians, let this mind be in you, which is also in Jesus Christ, Jesus, the mind, the Holy Spirit, and the power of God dwell in Christ, and he wants us to dwell in us also. For he, for he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that, are, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. So, why do you want to get rid of sin? So that one day, upon the return of Jesus Christ, that you can be a partaker of that divine nature to be born into the family of God, to see Christ as he really is, to be part of a wonderful government that's going to cease all these other human governments, to do away with all those things, and to do away with Satan, to fulfill the second part of the Day of Atonement. And Jesus Christ will reign supreme as King of kings and Lord of lords, and whatever uh, department head that God puts you in, in his in His. Uh, administration depends on how well you overcome, how well you want to be loyal and faithful to Jesus Christ. And that's what these days of unleavened bread are all about, is cleaning up our lives, that one day you're going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye and be born into the very family of God.